Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Transportation and Transit Committee meeting. Mayor Pro Tem Branch is absent and excused. We have one item on our agenda today. It is walkability and improving safety for uh, pedestrians. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Moore. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for taking the chair today. Appreciate the, your time uh, and uh, the opportunity to share some uh, some of the tools that we use for pedestrian safety here. Just to reset and re-level the playing field a little bit here, um, uh, Councilmember Jones had a question during one of our uh, public hearings about um, a project uh, over on uh, Edwards Mill Road across from Laurel Hills Park, a uh, very popular park that's currently closed. Uh, but we'll be reopening in a couple years and we'll see a lot more folks trying, you know, uh, attending and going to that. We'd like to make that available for people to walk. But as we know, Edwards Mill is a pretty wide road and the distance between signals right there are pretty, it's pretty distant, pretty far apart. Um, council member asked, uh, what are the tools that we use to help enhance uh, pedestrian safety and walkability? Today, we've got Jed Niffenegger, who is our uh, city traffic engineer, is going to run through some of those tools. Um, We'll uh, got about 25 slides. It should go about 20 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. And I just would like to reiterate: this is really today for your information. There's no action required, and we'd just um, like to share a few things with you. So we've got some background to talk in the future. So, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Neffenegger. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Jed Neffenegger. I'm in transportation. Uh, excuse the drink, I'm getting over COVID and I still have a cough, so uh, I am. Uh, thank you, Michael, also. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to share some of the, the policies that y'all have enacted and some of the initiatives we've had and uh, the su successes we've had in moving the needle and improving pedestrian uh, safety and walkability. So I got a real brief uh, presentation uh, we can go through. Uh, as Michael alluded to, this is educational. So anytime, if you have any questions, please stop me. I'll be happy to answer. Uh, before I get to the agenda, I just want to kind of point out that I'm going to focus on where we're at today. A lot of Raleigh's infrastructure was built uh, decades ago and was vehicle centric. Uh, so I'm focusing on recent policies and where we're at today. So the agenda, uh, we're going to talk about implementation of pedestrian infrastructure, or rather how it's built, uh, the effects of the UDO, which y'all approved in 2013, I believe, or your predecessors did, uh, Complete Streets, uh, a program I'm super excited about, Sean's actually here, Vision Zero, and uh, some of the tools and examples that, uh, I'll go over examples that we use to improve pedestrian safety. So, uh, infrastructure gets built in a handful of ways. Uh, one is private development. They, they have to follow the UDO requirements. Uh, another is uh, you hear about capital improvement projects. Uh, some are, uh, I think Atlantic Boulevard is getting near for, uh, to be let for construction or is it under construction. BRT, there was a presentation given at your last council about that. Uh, Oberlin Streetscape, Six Forks are another, uh, a couple other ones. Then there are spot projects. Uh, one that you probably have heard a lot about is the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program. We've had a lot of success with that program. Uh, we also install traffic signals. Uh, we do it on our network. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later as we go through. We have three right now that are under construction. We have sidewalk projects and we also, uh, as part of the Vision Zero program, we, we, we're focusing on safe routes to school. Uh, pulling back from a local level, going to the state level, <coughs> NCDOT has what's called STIP or State Transportation Improvement Projects. They're equivalent to our CIP ones. They're usually programmed on, uh, on the state level or through our MPO. You've heard of CAMPO, Capillary MPO. Uh, a lot of times uh, the state is getting better in trying to implement more complete street policies with their designs. but. Uh, sometimes we, we pay for betterments through municipal agreements, which would obviously come to y'all. Uh, and then we, we've been successful working with another group of DOT to get spot safety projects done. 
Uh, we have probably signalized maybe 10 to 12 intersections over the last five years, and we have about 10 more on the docket that DOT is uh, trying to get funding for. And these are intersections that unfortunately uh, developed a crash pattern or have some uh, extenuating circumstances where a, 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 a hawk, a traffic signal, is a mitigating measure to, to, to fix those locations. Uh, resurfacing is another opportunity that we take to improve infrastructure. Uh, resurfacing can be done in, uh, uh, it has two components to it. We do wheelchair ramps, and wheelchair ramps are the precursor for any time we add pedestrian uh, infrastructure. We need wheelchair ramps uh, to be compliant with ADA before we could even consider uh, like a Hawk or a RFB, which I'll, I'll get to some of those a little bit more later. And uh, resurfacing also allows us to install bicycle infrastructure. Uh, Y'all, we have a comprehensive bike plan and we use resurfacing as a uh, opportunity to get bicycle infrastructure installed. And then there's what I would classify as non-transportation projects. They're usually government entities, whether it's Wake County, uh, public, public school systems being built. Uh, the, the county's been building a significant amount of those with a recent bond, uh, fire stations, parks, things of that nature. Uh, the UDO, which was approved in 2013, is kind of a, a paradigm shift from, from the way we used to do stuff. And I'll have some slides later on to illustrate that. And it, it, it put a big focus on pedestrian and bike infrastructure, or required pedestrian and bike infrastructure. It also uh, did a good job of moving the, the buildings or the sites closer to the, the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, the setbacks. Uh, complete streets is is also uh, kind of like Vision Zero. It's an approach to to uh, make streets uh, better for all modes of uh, 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 transportation, accommodate all modes. Uh, you can kind of see uh, these are some of the tenants of the complete streets. Uh, also including complete streets, I know this wasn't what you asked for, but green infrastructure. You've heard of. Uh, LID stormwater devices. That's that's part of complete streets. Uh, and some some examples would be protected intersections, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. Medians, pedestrian refuge, obviously sidewalk and, and bicycle lanes. This next slide is uh, something I'm really excited about because it's it's close to where I live and, and ride my bike. Uh, this is on Blue Ridge Road is the Blue Ridge Road uh, Pedestrian Improvement Project. Uh, and this is at the Art Museum uh, at Blue Ridge. And there's a greenway connection that goes back towards uh, Umstead Park. And what this is, is a protected intersection. That is a complete street tool. Uh, we are implementing that this with, with that project. And we're looking at expanding it uh, protected intersections, potentially using them on Six Forks and a few other capital improvement projects. Uh, here are some examples of UDO and complete streets from a transit perspective. On the left, you'll see uh, a BRT station. Uh, the pedestrian infrastructure is going to be built with the, the, the transit stop. And the transit stops located in a location where pedestrians don't have to walk out of their way to get to them. It, it's purposely designed to be user friendly. The example on your le uh, right has a couple things I want to point out. It's called a floating transit stop. Uh, there's some added pedestrian safety benefits with that design. But also, if you take a look at the buildings there, uh, those are relatively new buildings and they were built after the UDO was adopted. And if you notice, they're very close to the sidewalk. They're incorporated with the sidewalk, which means uh, pedestrians don't have to cross a sea of asphalt and parking lot to access uh, storefront uh, buildings, which uh, increases the safety. Vision Zero, uh, Sean gave a presentation uh, a couple council sessions ago, and I won't uh, belabor this slide, but uh, Vision Zero 
uh, we're, we keep trying to uh, make it uh, known that it, it needs to be the foundation for all transportation projects. And we have to look at all transportation projects through the lens of Vision Zero and making sure that we're, we're hitting all those components. And, and those are just a list of some of the, the, the city programs that we're looking at through the lens of, of Vision Zero. So some of the goals of Vision Zero are to slower speeds. Uh, obviously, slower speeds affect the outcome if a crash were to occur. Uh, something is, is seemingly benign as lowering the speed limit from 40 to 30. Uh, if a crash were to occur, it, it increases the survivability rate by 200%, which is huge. Uh, and the impact to drivers is not that significant. It, well, the benefit to the uh, walkers is huge. Uh, another thing we're looking at doing is, is controlling conflict points. So uh, use of medians uh, and then signals where there are conflict points. In the past, we used to just use marked crosswalks for pedestrian crossings. Uh, our push is to try and control those more. Uh, <clears throat> State law, uh, North Carolina, some states have stop. North Carolina is a yield condition. So when a driver approaches a crosswalk and there is a pedestrian about to enter or in one, the vehicle is only required to yield. Uh, so the safety of the pedestrian is completely reliant upon the driver's behavior. If we install more robust traffic control devices, it improves the safety for walkers and encourages people to walk more. Uh, Vision Zero also wants to address high injury locations. That's part of our action plan that we got the grant for. We'll be going through and, and, and finding those locations and addressing those, coming up with mitigating measures. And uh, one of the other things we'll be doing is, is uh, one of the other things we'll be doing is, is so the UDO uh, are looking through the lens of Vision Zero and making sure that walkability and safety are, are, are paramount. Uh, these are just a couple examples of, of, of project approaches looking through the Vision Zero lens. So, for example, for private development, uh, Will's been working with our, with our uh, transportation development group to encourage developers to, uh, he, he's used the expression, he, doesn't, he wants to work him, him, his way out of a job. And if we don't build streets in an appropriate manner that discourages speeding, uh, then he'll continually have work. So we're working with uh, transportation development to make sure that the new residential streets that are built have components in them that will discourage speeding and, and promote uh, better speed compliance. Uh, for CIP and, and STIP projects, we obviously want to use the safest cross section, which would, you know, for the multi-lane roads would be median and controlling uh, the conflict points with, with traffic control devices being signals or, or something like that. Uh, one of the other things we haven't done the greatest in the past is if, uh, I have a slide I can illustrate it, but if we have a long distance between signalized points and there's trip generators between there, we as staff need to push to make some safe accommodation so that uh, we're not discouraging people from walking all by walking an elongated way to get to their destination. Uh, resurface and maintenance. In the past, uh, we used to use stuff like sharrows and, and just bike lanes, but now we're pushing for buffer bike lanes, which would, would, would give a, a, a added sense of security for, for cyclists that choose to use that infrastructure. Uh, and for non-transportation projects, all, for all uh, future parks, community centers, things of that nature. Uh, a good example, I think on Barwell Road, there was a fire station there and there's a school nearby. Uh, we're gonna use the Hawk as a, a preempt so the via, uh, fire engine can leave, but it will also serve uh, dual purpose. So school uh, uh, children that walk to and from school can, can have a safe crossing. Uh, these are some of the tools that we are going to use. Uh, 
I'll, I'll kind of touch on all of them. Engineers love acronyms, so uh, I apologize. RRFBs, Hawks, things of those you've probably heard. I can stop me if you, I'll try and go over them, but if, if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to stop me. I'm gonna go through a bunch of examples and kind of explain uh, our thinking and, ra and rationale and new approach. Uh, so the photo on the uh, left, if you can see it, is Wake Forest Road. It is uh, what we would call, a, uh, it has what's called a, a, a twiddle, a two-way left turn lane, suicide lane. Uh, access is not really restricted. Uh, you can see all the driveway points. Those are potential conflicts. Uh, the buildings are also set back fairly significantly, uh, maybe in if you, the upper right corner. You see that uh, fast food place and across the street. If you were on the sidewalk, you'd have to cross the parking lot. The UDL would encourage that to come closer. Over on the right, this is not apples to apples because this is more suburban setting, uh, but this is on Creedmoor Road. It has a median uh, section and the conflict points will be controlled uh, with signals. Uh, and the side streets, uh, would have access impacted, it would be right in, right out, but it is an inherently safer uh, cross-section. Uh, one of the projects that I'm extremely proud of is, uh, we've talked about this a bit, uh, we work with DOT and we're able to implement a downtown pedestrian safety uh, project. I think we were the first city in North Carolina to get DOT to partner with to do it, we lowered the speed limit in our downtown to 25, including DOT roads, which is a huge undertaking. Uh, we added LPIs, which are leading pedestrian intervals. If you walk around, you'll see the walk indication come on before the concurrent vehicle, so you can establish yourself in, in, the, in the pedestrian crosswalk. We have also removed dual turning movements. Uh, that we found uh, in the study was very problematic. What happens is when you have two vehicles turning, uh, you can cause a site uh, uh, impedance for the driver and the pedestrians and, and, and create a unfortunate situ uh, worst case unfortunate situation. Uh, you recently approved uh, a prohibition on right turns on red. Uh, that might have an impact on, on uh, vehicle efficiencies, but it will have a huge impact on pedestrian safety. Uh, we're also currently uh, piloting a tactical, I think it was in a manager's update, uh, we're working with the arts department, uh, tactical ins installation of artistic uh, pedestrian bump out. Uh, I got a photo of what one would kind of look like. Can I ask a quick question? Um, is that only going to be implemented in downtown or would, are we looking to do those throughout the city? Very good question. Uh, 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 let me provide a little background first and then you'll understand why. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, we installed some artistic crosswalks on Glenwood South. Uh, we also did a, uh, in one exchange plaza between uh, one exchange, the building, and, and uh, Moore Station, there uh, we had some artwork done. We used paint. Unfortunately, the lifespan of, of paint was six months to a year. So all the work that staff did, the artists did, after a very short period of time, it, you could barely see it. So. Uh, our goal is if we're going to do it, we want it to last so that there will be added benefit, uh, people can enjoy the art, uh, we're being good stewards of the public's money. So we're piloting two materials that should have very long lifespan. If the installation of them isn't too taxing from a staff and monetary resource, uh, I see no reason why we can't use these in dead spaces throughout the city. Uh, obviously, art is in the eye of the beholder. And working with the uh, art department, one of the things uh, we as transportation staff like is we know that they're going to vet the art that goes out in the public right of way so it won't uh, offend anyone or, or be a political statement. 
Uh, so if, if this pilot works, we would obviously look at, uh, I'll get to it in a minute, there's 20 mid blocks downtown. If we can't use concrete, tactically, we can do this a lot quicker. But uh, focus on downtown first and then uh, expanding it uh, citywide. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you so much. I just thought because you posted that Blue Ridge Road project that you're working on, and it's right next to the art museum. So I know I, I uh, sit on the Blue Ridge Corridor Alliance as well, and that is something that we had talked about before. So I'm like, that would be a really great area to do something like that right in front of the art museum. Um, but just that was what made me think if it's only going to be downtown, I'd like to see it expand out to the rest of us out here. Yep, and, and that, if we had had this pilot done beforehand, uh, obviously would have done it there. One of the last things we want to do is get artists, local artists, excited and have their product done to last for six months. So we're we're trying to be good stewards of the public's money, uh, and we're hoping that this these new materials will will have some longevity. Uh, and as I uh, alluded to, there's 20 mid block crossings downtown, which mean mid blocks an engineering term for uncontrolled crossing it's it's between two signals uh, and vehicle drivers are speeding up to get to the next light and oftentimes uh, or downtown where you have one uh, two uh, one way direction you can have two lanes and you can get one vehicle to yield and create a, a dual threat a shadow effect so uh, we're, we'll be looking at uh, increasing uh, the traffic control devices at this uh, whether it's RFBs uh, Hawks uh, or something like is shown here on this this photo. Uh, here an example of something that we we did used to do in the past. This is the Performing Arts Center. There is a parking lot kind of off screen to the south and west, and the way that pedestrians would get to their uh, destination would be to cross a three-lane cross-section. Uh, we don't feel that's uh, a safe or acceptable manner, and we're currently working uh, with the state uh, in Vision Zero program to look at a uh, potential installation of a hawk at this location. There's one over at Shaw as well. And then I think there's one or two up at the uh, government complex in the in, in, uh, northern area of the downtown. But this would be an uncontrolled crosswalk that in the past we just used to add markings. Uh, RRFB is an uh, acronym for Rectangle Rapid Flashing Beacon. And I don't know if you can see my, my mouse. Uh, See that light bar right there between the the peds walking in the downward arrow, the the mom and or the mom and child. The way they work is when depressed, unlike a flasher that goes all the time and and can create light pollution. When depressed, the flasher strobes very brightly. <clears throat> it doesn't stop traffic. But on a, a section like this where you only have one, uh, one lane in each direction, it does a very good job of alerting drivers that there is a person wanting to cross the road. So we're, kinda, we're going through, uh, Sean's program, Vision Zero, is going through all the school zones and, and trying to look at all the uh, uncontrolled crossings and, and, and try and come up with mitigating measures for ones that we don't feel are safe. Uh, here another example is uh, several years back we worked with Parks and Rec and we went through all the Greenway crossings. Uh, Greenway, uh, Parks and Rec's uh, cultural resource does a great job of building greenways but when they intersect the roadway it's kind of them, us. So a decade or so ago we took the responsibility to inventory all the Greenway crossings and come up with kind of a flow chart of the best way to improve them. Uh, in this location, you'll see we installed a median refuge. At that time, a hawk was uh, interim, uh, was only interim approval, it wasn't fully adopted. Uh, so we're in the process now of going back and revisiting all the greenway crossings and 
making sure that they're safe as possible, again, through the lens of Vision Zero, complete streets, programs like that. So you can see there's a hawk there, and the way a hawk works is if a person depresses it, it yellow light strobes, then it turns solid yellow, then solid red, stopping traffic, and then uh, it goes back and forth with the red lights, letting uh, vehicles know that if there's no peds, they can, uh, pedestrians, they can, they can continue on. Uh, I know this is more about walkability, but uh, for our, our cycling community, uh, we used to install what was called sharrows. They're the markings uh, you'll see in the photo on the left. And all they do is reinforce, reinforce that vehicles are supposed to share the, the road with, with cyclists. Uh, we have tried to move away from that and install high quality cycling facilities. Here an example is, uh, it's uh, over there on West Street. And this is a buffered bicycle lane. And that's what we're trying to push for, for, for new, new projects and whenever we resurface the street. Uh, Y'all have heard a lot about the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, the NTMP. That's been a real successful program. Uh, just a, a few highlights. We've lowered the speed limit on over 1,100 residential streets which is, is huge. Uh, again, that goes back to if, if a crash were to occur, the lower speeds uh, should result in a lower severity. We've also installed over 100 multi-way stops. I, I know uh, Councilman Branch brought up uh, about noise associated with uh, the multi-way stops, but uh, you know, for every action, there's a reaction, but the multi-way stops are inherently safer than uh, just a, a side controlled intersection. We've also installed uh, traffic calming devices on 68 streets, 19 are in progress, and I think Will has another 19 that y'all just approved that are working on. So we'll be up to close to 90 streets here that will have been calmed with uh, traffic calming. Uh, and these just go to show you the two different types of, of traffic calming treatments. Uh, to, to, to calm traffic, there's no silver bullet. And what you, the, the goal of, the, of calming or slowing speeds is you create some deflection and you either do it with vertical being speed bumps or, or, or speed tables, which are the first two, or you create a weaving pattern, which are the, is the bottom uh, pictorial, kind of showing you the devices that that uh, that accomplish that. Uh, there, we've installed. We're installing some right now on Clark, and we have gotten some very interesting comments. Uh, some people uh, love them. Some people don't know how to use them. Uh, so we've gotten a lot of of, of uh, inquiries uh, regarding that. That would be the mini circle over there on the lower left. Yeah, I just had a question about the uh, mini circles or when we're putting um, these kind of obstructions, you know, in the road. Um, are there opportunities or are we doing anything um, to create uh, uh, landscaping as well? I know, like, on Hillsborough Street, we have the landscaped, like, you know, in the middle of our um, uh, traffic circles. But in these particular, like, smaller ones, is that something that we're also doing? In the past, we, uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program tried to, encourage that and, and, and push for that. The problem became uh, was uh, liability. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, because we, an HOA, w we could only do this in neighborhoods that had HOA that carried uh, insurance. Because someone would be going in public right of way, doing work in public right of way with the plantings. Uh, we don't have the resources as a city if we started doing these all over with, with, with landscape to maintain them. So what we've been doing is uh, decorative, like stamped concrete, something that had some aesthetic. Uh, to your point, it would be nice if we could uh, do something green, but uh, just from, from the liability and, and, and maintenance burden, uh, that is something that we've kind of moved away from. Gotcha. I just had another quick question. Um, 
in these new, because I, I know I don't remember which street it was that I was driving down, but it, we did the weaving, uh, the yes, that. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of education do we give to the public to understand what we're doing? Because I know when I did that, I was like, what on earth is this and why am I doing this? Now that I see it, it makes sense retroactively. I'm like, oh, okay. But is there a way for us to proactively teach people how these work and the reasons they're being put in? Because I know I'm sure there's some frustration of, I don't know what this is. Uh, very good question. Uh it's kind of uh, uh, hard to answer. Uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program has a very large number of touch points with the uh, residents and the surrounding neighborhood explaining what we're doing, the intent, how they're supposed to function. So I would say for people that live along the street or the surrounding neighborhoods, they get it. For people that cut through, maybe not as much. Uh, could we do a better job of, of uh, utilizing uh, or telling that message on our city website, I'm sure we could, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to Will and, and we can explore that. Uh, but for the people that are most affected, uh, they they sh they should understand it because we have a very healthy public engagement process uh, for all NTMP projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And. That apparently is the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Do y'all have any additional questions? Councilmember Jones, or which one of you wants to go first? Um, I actually just had a question from Twitter today. <laughs> so On my list too. Oh, okay, They're perfect, ahead. yes. Um, and I don't know about this, so um, someone was asking about urban street above the curb, protected bike lane text changes. Do you know what that means or refers to? I do not. So maybe I, I can help. Uh, so um, don't remember the exact date that we did this, but we did go through uh, some updates on street design manual and the UDO. So when you, and we've talked to in the past about our Six Forks Road project, mm -hmm. that project will actually implement behind the curb elevated bike lanes separate from the sidewalks so that's probably what that's referring to um, we've not implemented that to date but when we do the six forks project you'll see that come into play so is that a best practice to it is think about for future it is considered yeah. a best practice mm -hmm. it is it is right it is space intensive okay. so, so that is need the room for it. and that is a that's a place where we have to be careful and measured to measure property impacts versus uh, the facility design, and we do a lot to kind of trying to find the balance there. You hear me use that word a lot, I'm afraid, <laughs> but we you try to find the right balance. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for um, indulging me in these questions. You know, um, as I am new and trying to navigate uh, what we're doing and the decision during rezonings and everything, my my biggest goal is to make sure that what we do on the small level in a in a rezoning or whatnot is helping to amplify the work that you are already doing. Um, I really hope that I can learn, as I learn, I, I get to put more tools in my toolkit of what to ask for to make sure we are pushing your message further because I am not a road engineer by any means, but I definitely want to make sure that as we grow the city, we are trying to um, foresee any issues with pedestrian safety. Um, is, as we referenced that specific case on Edwards Mill, it's right across from a city park. So that's really my biggest, like I, I, I don't, I feel, um, uh, irresponsible to put more people there, more families there when we can't access what we offer as, as an amenity. So that's why I asked to, to be educated on this subject. And I really appreciate uh, you answered a lot of questions that, that, that I had um, and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. I have a bunch of questions from the notes I took during the presentation. I don't think they'll take very long, but I'm gonna work my way through. Um, first, it's an easy one. Can we get these slides on uh, board docs? I, I noticed that the current presentation is the Vision Zero presentation from February 14th. We will certainly do that, and um, I have a couple of copies up here. I don't have three, I'm sorry. No, I, I have two. really more for the public and anybody who may be interested in, in going back, but I may go back and look at them. Too. Yeah, we will certainly get that up on board docs. Okay, the other question I had, or one of them, is for the Atlantic Avenue CIP project, What's the, did, I know we've put 
uh, bike lanes down Atlantic a certain extent. Is there, are we doing more work on Atlantic and what's the timeline on that? And I'm particularly interested in, um, I brought this up at a council meeting. We have a lot of development happening around Ironworks, I guess what they're calling like the east end of Raleigh now. And the stretch of um, East Whitaker Mill Road between Wake Forest and Atlantic is like particularly dangerous because there are no real sidewalks there. There's a curve and so there's a site visibility issue. And a lot of people are parking in neighborhoods and walking to restaurants and bars there now and people are walking between the establishments. And as we continue to build more retail, more housing, I think it's gonna get more and more. I'm really afraid someone's gonna get seriously hurt there. And so I'm just curious if we have any options. Kenneth Ritchie with Transportation. So yes, Councilmember Melton, we are looking at that area. Um, certainly the Atlantic Avenue project from New Hope to High Woods is under construction currently. Mm -hmm. And we also do have a design effort underway right now to extend the multi-use path from High Woods down to the Greenway connection. Okay. Uh, just but uh, that doesn't get Hodges. us quite down to Whitaker. Yeah, right so there. not quite all the way down to Whitaker Mill, uh, but we are looking at that entire corridor um, and trying to identify kind of a strategy for how we can can approach enhancing those facilities along that entire corridor. Okay, and that East Whitaker Mill, that small little section there, I, th I brought this up at a council meeting, but can we figure out if there's something low cost, high impact we can do there in the short term? We'll take a look at that. There's a, there is an issue with railroad permissions yeah. there, and that's something we'll have to work through. So, And I don't even think there's a crosswalk from one side of Atlantic to the other side of Atlantic where they're building a lot on that East Whitaker Mill. Like, I don't think you can even cross there right now. Safe. Is there a crosswalk? I don't recall, but we'll- I don't think there is. We'll take a look at that. Okay. Um, the other question I have is the, on Oberlin, that floating bus stop. Do we have a timeline on that? I remember that came to us like a year or so ago with a couple other ones, including one like downtown by one of the state buildings. Um, do we know when that's starting? So the Oberlin Road Streetscape project, if you'll recall, late last year, we did we had put that out for bid. We okay. only got one bid. It came in about 150% over budget. Oh. Um, so we have rebid that. I think okay. those bids should, we should be receiving those bids here in the next few weeks. So I would anticipate that coming forward to council probably in the next four to six weeks. And is that the first floating stop in the city? <sighs> Don't hold me to this, but I want to say yes. And do we have uh, plans to do to replicate it in other places? I certainly think that that's gonna be a best practice that we've seen in areas. Part of it too, obviously there's the, the protections for the pedestrians and creating that space for bicyclists. It's also better operationally for our transit mm -hmm. uh, system because the transit's not pulling off out of general purpose traffic and then trying to get back in. So certainly I think that'll be a, a tool that we'll probably be looking at moving forward. Okay, and then on the buffered bike lanes, I'm really excited about this. I mean, the paint helps, but there's also like a different sense of comfort when you know you have some separation. And one thing I've asked about since like 2020 was um, parking protected bike lanes. And we're starting to see some of them now, at least on downtown, like on West Street, both sides. Um, but are we able to implement more parking protected bike lanes? And can we make that more of a best practice? I know for a period of time, there was a concern about cleaning the bike lanes and access. But for me, it seems low cost because we're not having to actually invest in concrete or bollards. The cars provide the protection. And then I feel less concerned about folks getting doored because the bikes are on the right side of the car and not on the left. So yes, that is an area of best practice we are looking at trying to implement more regularly. Um, to the point of the, some of the cleaning concerns, uh, we do have equipment now yeah. that can help clean that. And we're actually working with BPAC right now to identify uh, some corridors for piloting that so we can start to look at what we may need for future Got in it. terms of different service levels for cleaning, maintaining the bike lanes too. Because we could, if you identify corridors, just switch the parking in the bike lanes with paint for now, right? I think one of them is, I think maybe all of them are bollard right now, but. On the surface, yes, it does look like that an easy flip, but obviously going out because a lot of that is the thermoplastic paint. So it's not just to okay. go out and black it over. You actually have to grind it up and then make the changes and with limited resources as it relates to striping and stuff, it does start to kind of look at prioritization there too. Yeah, if we could just paint it, I'd volunteer to go do it myself. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, we've talked about this, but now that we're starting to move towards some of this, like the bump outs with the art, um, I want to see if we can focus on some like place making with art, especially acknowledging some of our history. I've brought this up a lot. There's a lot of LGBTQ history in the warehouse district. 
which as that area continues to grow and change and develop, which is a good thing, I just want to make sure that we honor some of it. And I, I've talked about like rainbow crosswalks or some art, and I'm wondering if we can look at that again. I know we're piloting some of this bump out art over by um, just a couple blocks from here, but opportunities to do it elsewhere. I understand the issue with the paint. I will say Stonewall Sports, what, I'm not involved anymore, but they painted the cross, uh, a sidewalk with permission a few years ago for a tournament they hosted, and that's still there. So whatever paint they used is, is maybe it's different than what needs to be used on the street, but that's certainly lasted longer than six months. Yeah, I'll, um, let, let me help just a little bit here. Um, uh, yeah, it, it has lasted very well. There's a little bit of a difference between foot traffic yeah, and automobile traffic. Yeah. So, um, so that's a, a kind of a important difference there. Um, we can we'll certainly look at that. You know, um, the the beauty to doing the um, the bump out areas like that is, you know, those are naturally areas that you want to keep clear of parking for the visibility of pedestrians. Uh, so they do present a great opportunity for us to do something there. You may note we were very specific to use uh, illustration that did not paint the crosswalk yeah. and the bump outs. Um, we'll have to do a little bit of work on this, but uh, we have seen um, federal highways go after communities and yeah. about painting crosswalks. It's a, it's a touchy subject and we're trying to Find a way that we can help everyone thread the needle on that and be, yeah. uh, and 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 be r responsive to the community, but also be careful about kind of some of our regulatory partners. But so. we could bump if there's opportunities in the warehouse district to do bump outs. We could maybe do something. Absolutely. Okay. Do you have a can you help me understand why they don't like? Well, I don't understand. Uh, I think there is a. a th <laughs> it, it's it's a matter of. Um, trying to create sort of a universal understanding of what a crosswalk is and, ha and having it be universally recognized. So certain traffic markings, they try to create a great deal of uniformity to it. Um, there's a counter argument that the ambiguity, you mentioned the, um, utilize, the having to do the chicanes and follow the chicanes, the ambiguity makes you slow down. It's like, what do I do? I slow down so I can figure it out. There's a counter argument that says that that kind of, I'm not so sure, but I know that that's a crosswalk where people are could help people slow down and make them more safe. I'll just say that the, the, the best practice and the knowledge base has not kind of caught up to community concerns yet. So. And just to follow up with that, um, what is the, they have ultimate control over that? Who, who ultimately decides? Like if the city wants to do it and there's some hesitation from the transfer, do they have the final say? So we we do follow a manual that's called the Manual of Uniform Traffic code devices it's almost like the traffic engineers bible and if there's deviation from that it could create it could affect our eligibility for federal funds take our money found from, to be in yeah they'll yeah. take our money away oh, I see. or never give us or never. <laughs> and we're Thank asking you. them for a lot of money these days <laughs> yeah we don't want to mess with that i've got three more and then we'll be done i'm sorry uh, I just want to acknowledge that the leading pedestrian intervals i think that's been hugely helpful so thank you who are for getting that up and running um, and then the neighborhood traffic management program, we've done 1,100 residential streets. Um, are those the ones that come to us on the consent agenda? Because it feels like we're kind of doing it piecemeal. Are those by petition requests? Or are we doing it proactively? And if so, like, are we able to just knock them out in larger chunks? Or is there a reason they come in like two, three, four at a time? Uh, good, very good question. Uh, we gave a, uh, a presentation a while back about that. Uh, ideally, it would be, from a staff level, it would be easier, and, and from, from your approval of the traffic schedule, it would be easier if we had a mandate to do all residential so streets. how do we need to do that? The problem is if we did a mandate to implement it all at once uh, on residential streets, would we'll put a huge burden on staff and have a huge cost of getting these signs out there. But couldn't you do them on a rolling basis and not have to keep coming back for like if we give you a mandate then you could figure out the timeline without having to come back every time uh we could certainly do it that way i think what we're what you're seeing today is not necessarily two or three at a time but yeah. we're, we're doing whole neighborhoods at a time yeah yeah and and it's a pretty good cadence that staff is able to respond to and keep up with and so, and it doesn't, you know, the sign shop is doing those streets plus all the other regulatory signs that we're doing. So it's a pretty good cadence. I'm not sure that we would actually be able to increase the velocity without additional resources. And, and one thing to point to, to Michael's uh, 
point about re resources, we can leverage Vision Zero, and uh, as part of the uh, action plan, one of those would be to get the remainder of those streets, and we could use Vision Zero funding to pay for the signs uh, to help us with that and get the, the remaining. Uh, so keep moving forward, and then that, that could yeah. is a potential way to clean it up. The reason I'm curious about a blanket mandate is twofold. It's really one thing. It's public expectation. Because mm -hmm. um, some folks are like, well, why are these neighborhoods getting taken care of? When's my neighborhood going to happen? And if there's a mandate, then everyone knows that they're all going to get the same treatment. It's just a matter of staff figuring out when and how. And then the other thing is people have asked, like, why are they doing this, like, three, four, however many it is at a time? Because um, I think it sends a different message if we just say we're going to do it everywhere and y'all figure out when and how to prioritize. That's just something I've, I've thought about. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you have done that I will give council a lot of credit for, you, some time ago we changed the, the approach where, excuse me, as new um, subdivisions come into the system, rather than coming into the system at um, 35, which is the legislative mandate, they're coming in at 25. Ba that's basically created a situation where we don't have to go back and retroactively do that. So I would like to just you know, point out, y'all have done some good work to help us out on that case where we're, we're not having to go back and retroactively affect. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have. Go ahead, Councilmember Harrison. Yeah, a couple more. Um, and this came up at our um, District D Neighborhood Alliance meeting on Saturday, and I wanted to make sure that um, for anyone watching um, that they can um, figure out how to provide input. So it's just a question if someone notices an unsafe, you know, area for pedestrians or bicyclists or, you know, with traffic, um, what is the best way for them to, to let us know at the city? So currently on the screen in front of you, you have an email address that I'll just put Jed on the spot here and say. <laughs> Sorry, Jed. Uh, if, if you can reach out to Jed, Jed can get those channeled properly and get them to the right spot that we can get them addressed. So. Awesome. Happy, happy to have an influx. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then one other question, um, just something I, I notice regularly is that a lot of, um, you know, sometimes the paint markings on our roads as well as reflectors don't seem to be in the best condition. Do you feel like we're kind of in a backlog on a lot of that? Or how do we get, I guess, closer up to speed on that? Yes, uh, Jed can probably address yeah, that, but we are in a bit of a backlog, I would uh, say. That is a uh, sore subject in my, my division. Uh, Historically, uh, pavement marking program, the city's pavement marking program was supposed to be a stopgap between when streets got resurfaced and the pavement markings wore out. Uh, generally, pavement markings, depending upon traffic volume, will last anywhere from seven to uh, 12 years uh, with vehicle traffic. Uh, the heavier, obviously, the less. And Historically, we used to resurface roads at a faster, faster pace. So, for example, if we resurfaced every road every 20 years, we would have a shorter window where we would have to maintain that. I think our current uh, resurfacing is, I want to say, close to 50 years, uh, uh, something like that. It, it, it's, it's, it's fairly lengthy because uh, although uh, there was a... Uh, 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 an increase in, in taxes to help with that. A lot of that funding went to uh, wheelchair ramps and ADA improvements. So we are looking at all possible ways to uh, improve, maximize, and, and eke all the efficiencies out of the pavement marking that we can because they are important, mm -hmm. they're safety component. Uh, so the resources that we have uh, we have been focusing on using them on crosswalks and, and stop bars and uh, the, the areas that, that carry more, uh, more safety concerns. But that is something that we're currently uh, working on internally and we haven't found uh, a, a great solution yet. We are working with the state and we're hoping to leverage some funds they have too, uh, but that, that's ongoing right now. Yeah, it is something I hear about regularly for folks that are driving at night that they're they are struggling to see. So, um, anything we can do to find resources in that um, you know uh, realm, I think, would be greatly appreciated. Anything else? 
I just want to say really quickly, um, thank you for giving us this space to have the conversation. Uh, I really hope to use committee meetings where we can learn as well as put rezone, you know, send stuff to specifically in the moment, but to have wider discussions about how we do this in the future and how, as we're talking uh, about changes that are happening in our city, we can proactively include all of this. And now that I have this in my back pocket, I can make sure this is incorporated. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for indulging me in this conversation. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else, Mr. Moore? All right. Meeting adjourned. Thanks.